Welcome to my channel, Reading Radical Feminism. Please like and subscribe. Today, I will be starting off Gynecology by Mary Daly. Gynecology, the meta-ethics of radical feminism with a new intergalactic introduction by the author. New intergalactic introduction. In the year 1975, my world split open in the most positively revolting ways imaginable. That year marked my entry into a new realm of qualitative leaping through galaxies of mind space. I was moving far out on my spiraling intergalactic voyage, which I recall as beginning in utero or perhaps even eons before that traumatic period. 1975 was the year I began writing gynecology. It was a startling, stunning time consisting of moment after moment of spinning integrity. I believe that this book could not have been written earlier because before that time there was no context which would have allowed for the possibility of its becoming. But that year was marked by a convergence of many events which hurled me into utterly new dimensions of thinking, living, loving, writing, and being. At this point, is an important, it is important to explore that context. The watershed year. During the first week of January 1975, I embarked on a bizarre adventure that was typical of the time. This time, which I now name the third spiral galaxy of my voyage. I had been invited to deliver a paper at the Second International Symposium of Belief in Vienna, which was sponsored by Cardinal Koenig of Vienna and the Angeli Foundation. The participants in the symposium were world-renowned theologians and sociologists of religion. Nearly all were males, and most of the papers were pedestrian, pedantic, and in a word, dry as dust. Since the situation could not have been more incongruous, I decided to be congruous with this incongruity by wearing my usual cords and boots. I sported a terrifying tiger t-shirt, which I thought was appropriate for the subject of my paper, quote, radical feminism, the qualitative leap beyond patriarchal religion, end quote. Among those in attendance when I read my paper was Cardinal Koenig himself. The appearance of his eminence inspired me, in a perverse sort of way, to be as ferocious as possible, with unmitigated, unmitigated gall, or maybe simple forthrightness. I explained that my presence there was an experiment, questionable and problematic to myself, not wishing to bore myself by returning to quote square one end quote for the benefit of this August assembly, I succinctly summarized my previous thought in 23 theses and moved on from there. I also have photos of myself smoking cigars with Emily. The cigars had been passed out on silver, tr silver trays together with champagne by s female servants in black uniforms to the men present. We simply could not refuse the opportunity to help ourselves. After the reception, Emily, Robin, and I went out to a Viennese vine garden, wine garden, and the next day we took off by train for Venice, where we happily drank delicious wine, La Crema Cristi del Vesuvio, the Tears of Christ of Vesuvius, in the Piazza San Marco. A couple days later, I made a complicated series of plane connections in stormy weather and arrived back in Boston just in time to teach my, eth my 430 class in feminist ethics. I felt buffeted by swirling energies then as the spring semester of 1975 was beginning. There was much excitement in the air. For me personally, there was the smoldering knowledge and expectation that the new edition of The Church and the Second Sex would be coming out any day with its autobiographical preface and new feminist post-Christian introduction. It was like waiting for a new time bomb to be released into the atmosphere. In addition to that expectation, there was my anticipation of Boston College's decision regarding my application for promotion to the rank of full professor. I had applied in the fall of 1974, and now in January, word of the university's decision was due momentarily. By any and all standards of academia, academentia, <laughs> 
This was a highly appropriate time to have applied for the full professorship. I had published, in addition to dissertations, two major books, The Church and the Second Sex, first brought out by Harper Rowe in 1968, and Beyond God the Father, Toward a Philosophy of Women's Liberation, Peak in Press, 1973. By the fall of 1974, the latter was used as a college text in universities and seminaries across the country and was excerpted in several publications. In addition, I had made contributions to more than 10 books and had published more than 20 articles in professional journals as well as in feminist periodicals. I had done substantial committee work in a variety of areas, had given more than 70 public lectures, and had presented papers to learned, sick <laughs> societies, <sighs> sorry, um, uh, to, um, I had presented papers to learned, bracket, sick societies. I was listed in a dozen or so who's 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 who dictionaries and encyclopedias. I also had seven, seven, seven degrees, three of them doctorates. Oh my God. I mentioned these tedious details of my qualifications because of the university's decision, unbelievably, was negative. My students and many other supporters demanded an explanation. So the department chair, quote, explained to interviewers from the Heights, the student newspaper, dated February 10th, 1975, Begin quote, she has made no significant contributions to the field. In terms of achievement, Mary's case seemed to rest on that book, brackets, Beyond God the Father, and it is not a distinguished academic achievement, <laughs> end quote. At a subsequent meeting, February 24th, the university's attorney made an, an astonishing analogy between my case and that of Eric Segal, Siegel, who was popu whose popular novel Love Story was not considered a scho not considered a scholarly work, entitling entitling him to promotion in the classics department at Yale. Feminists from all over the United States protested Boston College's absurd denial of my promotion. On February 27th, we created a stunning event, a kind of meta response to the whole situation, a forum on women, women in higher education held in Roberts Center, a large gymnasium at Boston College. About 1,000 women packed the gym as Robert, Robin Morgan, who's been on WDI, began the forum with the battle cry, quote, sisters we meet on bloody Jesuit ground, end quote. Nine women educators from various, quote, fields then spoke, most of whom related experiences of discrimination, denial of tenure, and firings at universities across the country. This event revealed to all of us all of us present that radical feminists teaching in all departments were being purged from universities. The revelations of this forum, combined with Boston College's disparagement and attempted erasure of Beyond God the Father, as well as all of my work, and indeed my very being, fomented enormous explosions in my psyche. They unleashed my powers and hurled me further on my intergalactic voyage. I was thrown into greater and greater freedom. Since Beyond, the God, Beyond God the Father had been super scholarly and yet had been quote, called, quote, unscholarly by the cynical and deceptive fathers of reversal, I was now liberated into the possibility of qualitatively other daring deeds. It was not the case that I would become less scholarly. Indeed, I was now free to become even more so and to leap creatively further into the background. Moreover, the true horror stories of the radical feminists driven out of academia that year kindled my righteous rage, which was slash is creative rage. I knew then fully that my scholarship and originality would never be rewarded within the quote system, that my rewards would be utterly other, chiefly in the work itself and what this communicated to other women. The wide foreground context of this watershed year was the media's foreclosure on feminism. This was typified in a cover story in Harper's Magazine entitled, quote, 
Requiem for the Women's Movement, end quote. The picture on the cover was of a woman in mourning wearing, quote, widow's weeds. The intended message was obvious. There was, however, a deep background context. Despite signs of regression, the movement was moving, spiraling farther and farther. More and more women were, quote, coming to consciousness, end quote. That is, waking up and awakening each other from the patriarchal state of sleeping death. Moreover, there was a widespread eagerness, a profound lust for leaping beyond the patriarchal constrictions of mind slash body slash emotion that were still holding us back. Indeed, the women's movement was not dead. It had to some extent gone underground slash undersea, but slash and it was, as it is now, vibrant slash alive with expectation and hope. Despite erasure by the media and other patriarchal institutions, there was by 1975 a substantial body of feminist writings, as well as artwork, music, films, and organizations of all kinds. And despite the widespread purging of radical feminists from academia, women's studies existed and was expanding, and some few radical feminists did manage to survive on the boundary of academia and of uh, and of women's studies itself. In addition, there was a large women's network, which was rapidly becoming international slash global. This had not yet settled down to comfortably, too comfortably into, quote, women's communities, nor had the massively pacifizing effects of the therapeutic establishment or of new age style, quote, goddess spirituality, unquote, blended blunted the radical impulse. Nor has, this is a footnote, nor has the radical impulse yet been defeated. Many furies and harpies are committed to the task of fanning its flames so that ever greater combustions slash conflagrations, conflagrations will continue to self-ignite. All right. The dream of a, quote, feminist university, too, was alive and well among women in 1975. A manifestation of this was Sagaris, a feminist summer school held in Lindenville, Vermont, at which I taught courses during the first session. In many ways, no doubt, this experiment, quote, failed, but even as a flawed incarnation of the dream, it created a memory of the future, a hope that something else could be. In 1975, also, my lesbian lifetime took on a new dimension. Complex and tumultuous from the start, my experience of ecstatic connectedness at this time made it possible for me to spin gynecology so that it flourished in ways that previous books had not. No doubt, had there not been such a bedazzling connection, I would have written a book during this time, but it would, I am sure, have been less alive and daring than gynecology became, as it unfolded into its own shape of being. It was in the rich, ecstatic, powerful aura, parentheses, ozone, of my connectedness with Denise that my writing flowed and sparkled deep into the hag time of night and early morning. In the time before sunrise, the landscape slash seascape slash skyscape of this book opened up to me, and I was heard into the right words by the sparking and spinning of that boon companion who arrived in title time. Title, title with the D. Doorway after doorway of my imagination was flung open as I raced through the labyrinthine passages of my own mind, facing and naming the myths and actual atrocities of goddess murder all over this planet and their interconnectedness. And uh, amazing, the master's mazes in order to discover and celebrate gynocentric ecstasy. The spinning and weaving of this work. As I began researching, uh, that is searching for this work in the summer of 1975, the 
process involved reading and taking notes on all sorts of materials on plain eight by 11 inch white pads and filing them in manila folders according to topic. It was very clear near, near the beginning of this undertaking that the basic theme of the book would be the soul drama or other world journey involving encounters with demons who are personifications of the deadly sins and who block gateway after gateway of the journey. The difference between the classical patriarchal description of the other world journey and mine is fairly simple. In gynecology, the demons that block the ways of voyaging spinsters are manifestations flesh incarnations of patriarchy itself as amazing amazons with our labrises we cut them down and move deeper and deeper into the other world which since we are other is our homeland my files of notes increased fantastically in magnitude and in multitude. Within a few weeks or a few months, I am not sure which, the actual writing began. It was clear near the beginning of this writing process when the moment of the title of this book arrived. It popped into my mind, seemingly out of nowhere. The spelling was not immediately clear to me, even though the sound of the word was clear. It would be, I knew, either gyne-ecology or gyne-slash-ecology. With a short time, it became clear that the slash, not the hyphen, was right. I really wanted to slash the male-controlled slash woman-controlling, quote, science of gynecology. The slash was also visually extendable into a labrys, and indeed, this possibility was realized on the cover of this book. Eventually, I had a footlocker, brim full of folders, and also had several chapters written. These were in the order of the deadly sins as I had renamed them, and the titles of the original chapters were as follows. Chapter 1, Flying Fetuses, Processions from Womb to Tomb. Chapter 2, The Games of the Fathers, Prostitution and the Younger Professions. Chapter 3, A Broom of One's Own, On Escaping from the State of Possession. Chapter 4, Aggression, the Reign of Terror. Chapter 5, Obsession, Broken Hearts, Purple Hearts, Sacred Hearts. By the time I had reached the middle of the original Chapter 5, I realized that I had taken on an enormous task. I was only in the process of writing a first draft and had just begun work on the fifth of the eight deadly sins of the fathers, and I already had several hundred pages. Clearly, this book would require a long time to write. In May 1975, I had applied for a Rockefeller Foundation Humanities Grant, and in March 1976, I was awarded a very substantial grant from that foundation. Since I was on unpaid leave of absence from my teaching job at Boston College, this grant was literally a lifesaver. It allowed me the time to write this lengthy work and to pay much needed research assist assistance. So Gyne slash ecology unfolded and unfolded. I began to contemplate the possibility that it might become a work of nine volumes. I do not say this as a joke or by way of exaggeration. It is indeed what I thought. Then I thought that there would be three volumes, of which gynecology would be the first. I had a general idea that this book would deal chiefly with the first three sins on my list of deadly sins of the father, which are processions, professions, and possession, parentheses, deception, pride, and avarice, end parentheses. I thought the second volume would be about the next two sins, namely aggression and obsession, or anger and lust. And these did become the core theme of her book, Pure Lust, Elemental Feminist Philosophy, which was published five and a half years after this book. Um, okay, the third volume, I then believed, would be about encounters with assimilation, elimination, and fragmentation, parentheses, patriarchal gluttony, envy, and sloth. Um, these are, to some extent, challenged in Webster's first new intergalactic wickedary of the English language, conjured in cahoots with Jane Caputi, Beacon Press, 1987. They are really taken on in outer course, The Bedazzling Journey. 
I did not yet realize that the writing of gynecology itself would take three years. As I began the rewriting of gynecology, that is, the second draft, something, or rather some things, strange, started to happen. For one thing, the whole shape of the work shifted radically. Indeed, the entire writing process became a stunning experience of shape-shifting. This word is, I think, accurately defined in the Wiccadary as, quote, transcendent transformation of symbol shapes, idea shapes, relation shapes, emotion shapes, word shapes, action shapes, semicolon, moon-wise metamorphosis, end quote. Moreover, in the shape-shifting process, the writing became more and more condensed. Whole pages sometimes became one paragraph or perhaps one sentence. The fire and focus were intense, burning away what seemed to be unnecessary words, forcing me to create new words. Often, the new words arose as a result of chases through the dictionary, which involved the uncovering of etymologies, definitions, and synonyms, which in turn led to further word hunts and discoverings. Footnote, a simple example of the discovering of the fact that, according to Webster's, the word fashion is etymologically linked to fascist. This is indeed thought-provoking. Fashion and fascist, yes. Okay, clearly then, the chapters changed. The outline changed, I changed. I sometimes broke into incantations, chants, and alliterative lyrics. As I wrote in the in original introduction to this book, the end quote, at such moments, the words themselves seem to have a life of their own. They seem to want to break the bonds of conventional usage, to break the silence imposed upon their own backgrounds. They become palpable, powerful, and it seems that they are tired of allowing me to, quote, use them and cry out for a role reversal. End quote. There's, there was nothing contrived about this process. I did not sit down and think that this work required a, quote, different style and then attempt to create it. I simply risked leaping into the process of gynocentric writing, which meant that the work, in a real sense, created itself. Love that. A part of this, of the peculiar phenomenon of the writing of this book was its timing. My muse or muses invariably waited until evening to arrive and stayed around until I was more than ready to collapse with fatigue. Since the inspiration tended to become stronger during the wee hours of the night, I struggled and fought against the temptation to stop just when the spinning was at its beginning. Although I was not in a, quote, trance when writing gynecology, I was in a special mode of creative consciousness, which stemmed in part from a will to overcome all phallocratically imposed fears and move on the journey of gynocentric creation. The fears that haunted me were legion. I was worried at first that no one would publish such an outlandish book, and then that even if it did find a publisher, it would receive only horrendous reviews or dead silence from the critics. I was haunted by the specter of being considered, quote, off the wall, end quote, because of its outrageous style and ruthless unveiling of patriarchal myths and atrocities. I was afraid that non-comprehending editors would say the style was, quote, gimmicky. She has a footnote that says, of course, they did, but this did not dis courage discourage her uh spelled courage the positive flow of my muse which much was much stronger than their negativity um of course i was expecting the worst and another footnote i could not then guess that gynecology would be received so warmly and so widely immediately upon publication nor could i have guessed that this response would endure um, back to the text. However, I had a network of friends, so it was not possible to imagine for too long a period of time that I was a cognitive minority of one. 
Moreover, after I had written some of the new material, I experimented with presenting it in my public lectures at colleges around the country. The results were positive and encouraging. So I was spurred on to become an even more positively revolting hag. Indeed, the emergence of hag-related words, as well as such names as crone, spinster, harpy, fury, and other new words, was an integral part of the writing process. And when I spoke these aloud to women, I was committing acts of bespeaking. I was speaking the words into being. Nor was I alone in this process. Wild women heard me into be, be speaking, and together we were forming, forging a meta language that could break through the silence and the sounds of phallocratic babble. Somewhere on the journey of writing gynecology, especially when I was working far into the night, a, form, a sort of formula came to me, which could be called a mantra, or perhaps more accurately, a witch's self-determining spell. The words, as I recall them, were, quote, no matter what happens to me afterward, or as consequence, I will write this book, end quote. The spell carried me through the dark nights of my soul's journey and onward into more bedazzling adventures. A comparable phenomenon had happened a few years before in the process of writing Beyond God the Father. Then the mantra slash spell had simply been, quote, I have to turn my soul around, end quote. What this meant in part was that I had to turn my soul away from what I had called, quote, beta, that is, the tedious, time-consuming, mind-consuming foreground junk that was pushing to preoccupy me, such as worrying about schedules, paying bills, shopping, etc. ad nauseum. Often in the afternoons, I could, literally, I could literally see Beta trying to push itself through the door. Of course, on a deeper level, turning my soul around referred to an enormous breakthrough phenomenon. When I came to the writing of gynecology, I still had to keep the everlasting attacks of beta at bay, of course. But I had been but I had by then already turned my soul around. That is, I had begun the meta patriarchal journey already during the time of Beyond God the Father. Now the task was a more intensified turning. It was the task of weaving connections in such ways that I was in fact spinning the integrity of my own being and knowing, experiencing vertigo and moving into uncharted realms. This leads me to the important subject of the intergalactic context of gynecology. The intergalactic context of gynecology. Remembering my own voyage as a radical feminist philosopher, I am intensely aware of the struggle to stay on my true course, despite undermining by demons of distraction and fragmentation that have always attempted to pull me off course. These I gradually discovered and learned to name as agents and institutions of patriarchy, whose intent is to keep me and indeed all living beings within the stranglehold of the foreground, that is, fatherland. My true course was and is outer course, moving beyond the imprisoning mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual walls of the state of possession. Insofar as I am focused on outer coursing, outer coursing naturally i am surrounded and aided by the benevolent forces of the background this voyage could also be called inner course since it invol involves delving deeply into the process of communication with the self and with others a process that demands profound and complex passion remembering and understanding it could also be called countercourse, since it requires Amazonian acts of courageous battling. However, its primary slash primal configuration is accurately named outercourse. 
For this is a voyage of spiraling paths, moving out from the state of bondage. It is continual expansion of thinking, imagining, acting, being. I now see the spiraling paths of my outer coursing voyage as made up of moments which have momentum hurling me beyond foreground limitations they are acts of leaping through portals into the background i think that whenever a woman leaps in this way she brings others with her by example by inspiration her courage is contagious hence moments slash movements of outer course are political slash metapolitical like stars moments are born they happen in the twinkle of an eye the eye slash eye capital i footnote conversations with jane caputi okay um in my experience one moment leads to another this is because it has consequences in the world and thus moves me to take a leap to the next moment my focus as a voyager directs the interactions among the moments as seen from my present perspective the paths of my voyage constitute four spiral galaxies. Where slash when then does gyne slash ecology appear in the previously uncharted realms of this voyage? To answer this question briefly, it emerged near the beginning of the third spiral galaxy. To explain this, it is important to look at the larger intergalactic context, like the spiral galaxies of the universe. Um, we have a footnote here. Oh, we have to read this one. A spiral galaxy of the universe is defined as, quote, a galaxy exhibiting a central nucleus or a barred structure from which extended concentrations of matter forming curved arms, giving the overall appearance of a gigantic pinwheel, end quote, from Webster's. Pinwheel. <laughs> okay, like the spiral galaxies of the universe, the galaxies of outer course are in perpetual motion. At a certain point in this whirling progression, the Voyager is enabled to take an especially momentous qualitative leap and thus begin a new galaxy. Since the focus and momentum are from the same source slash force, the new galaxy moves in harmony with the preceding one. The first spiral galaxy of my voyage, which began whenever I began and continued in terms of foreground time through 1970, consisted of moments of prophecy and promise. The part of the voyage involved overcoming foreground illusions about, quote, the future and realizing the opening of my background future. This was the galaxy in which the church and the second sex was written. The second spiral galaxy swirled through the years 1971 to 1974. This consisted of moments of breakthrough and recalling. It was the time especially of seeing into and through the foreground quote past into the background past beyond the phallocratic myths and symbols. It was a time of naming the lies about women's history and recalling our own archaic origins. This was the galaxy of beyond God the Father and of the writing of my, quote, new feminist post-Christian introduction, end quote, to the church and the second sex. The momentum of these moments hurled me into the third spiral galaxy, which consisted of moments of spinning integrity. This swirled from early 1975 into the late 1980s. Gyne Ecology, which was completed in 1978, was my first major work of this time, and it was followed by Pure Lust and Webster's first new intergalactic wickedary of the English language. Moments of spinning integrity moved me out of the foreground present into the present. Gynecology, as participating in this time of the third galaxy, 
incorporates also the background, future, and past. For as my vision and being in the present changed slash changes, the past and future also change. Footnote, for example, by the time of gynecology, such words as post-Christian had become unimportant to me. Such a term had focused attention on where I had been rather than on where I now had arrived. It seemed that to keeping, keep stressing it would be comparable to a woman's dwelling on her divorce and identifying as a divorcee long after the event had occurred. End footnote. It is from the vantage point of the fourth spiral galaxy, however, that I can now look at gynecology and understand it in new ways. This is the galaxy of time traveling. It is a meta galaxy or mega galaxy made of moments of momentous remembering. By time traveling, I can retrace earlier moments as with a pen of light. The earlier moments take on new significance and assume richer meanings as I revisit them in the fourth dimension. It is in this way that I now see, hear, touch gynecology. I know it and I know it again in an ever widening spiral of remembering. Gynecology as a work of piracy. From my perspective, a momentous remembering, I now see gynecology as a daring piratic enterprise. Having been a pirate for many years, I righteously plundered treasures of knowledge that have been stolen and hidden from women, and I have struggled to smuggle these back in such a way that they can be seen as distinct from their mind-binding trappings. After voyaging for a while, I began in the second gallery to reclaim these treasures by naming them in new ways in order to render their liberating potential accessible to women. For example, many years ago and beyond God the, God the Father, I plundered the Christian idea of the, quote, second coming, end quote, and transformed it to mean, quote, the second coming of women, end quote. Since then, I have moved on to far more daring and disreputable deeds. In gynecology, as in Beyond God the, Father, God the Father, I took on the massive symbol system of patriarchal religion. My tackling of these symbols in both books involved abstract analysis. I used the highly evolved craft of philosophical and theological reasoning arguing on the enemy's own turf turf i also used theoretical analysis to confront patriarchal strategies such as reversal erasure particularization and universalization in gynecology i went beyond the scope of beyond god the father First, the analysis is not restricted to Christianity, but extends to the universality of patriarchal religion itself. Second, the synthesis of abstract reasoning and metaphoric expression expands and intensifies in new, as new words proliferate. Moreover, since I had decided to, quote, go the whole way, end quote, with radical feminism, the way was wide open for amazing and spinning. In other words, for exorcism and ecstasy. So my symbol smashing broke down barriers to creative thought and my focus became fierce. In gynecology, then, I plundered vast amounts of material from the patriarchal thieves. In the case of myths and language, I worked to smuggle back to myself and other women meanings that had been hidden, buried, reversed, as well as new meanings. This involved the creation of more and more new words, new images. For example, I retrieved the word and image argonaut, which rightfully applies to slash belongs to women. I wrote to expose the atrocities perpetrated against women under patriarchy on a planetary, planetary scale and show the profound connections among these goddess murdering atrocities. To this purpose, I discovered the Sado ritual syndrome. Footnote. 
since this is a long one since gynecology was published the agents of patriarchal evil have invaded women and nature with more and more virulent attacks their tentacles have grown and multiplied i have found that the seven point sado ritual syndrome explained on 130 to 133 of this book and applied throughout the second passage continues to work very well as a tool for analyzing the escalating horrors of the sado society and for showing the connections among them to list a few of these quote developments a $10 billion pornography industry has developed and continues to escalate. Its images of the torture, murder, and dismemberment of women and girls are everywhere, quote, inspiring more and more rapists and sex murderers to copy these images. Woman battering and incest are alarmingly widespread. The reality of these horrors has always existed under patriarchy, but in recent years there has been an increase not only of information about them, but also of the practices themselves. There has been an upsurge of international trafficking in women. Women of color are the primary victims of this atrocity as well as all other crimes. The demand for child prostitutes is enormous, especially around military bases and as, quote, tourist attractions, end quote. The new reproductive technologies had developed at an alarming rate, taking on forms that reduce women to subhuman, quote, subjects of experimentation, the torture of animals in laboratories and an agribusiness beggar's description and the life killers continue to kill the earth and its inhabitants back to the text as i plundered and smuggled back the information about worldwide atrocities this required investigation of patriarchal resources. It was an agonizing process. I had to look at the horrible material, which often included photographs of the maimed women, especially in the cases of foot binding and genital mutilation. Read it over and over again. Write about it. Rewrite early drafts about it. Proofread it over and over. The horrors burned themselves into my brain, yet this knowing had to happen and be communicated. As I uncovered the connections, I began to spin ever more wildly, and my journey became more ecstatic. I was fired by the white heat of accumulating rage, which hurled my pirate vessel around and ahead to the ecstatic being of the third passage. This brings me to the subject of my craft as a pirate, particularly as it applies to gynecology. My pirate's craft. My time traveling adventures and my life as a pirate has been possible because of my craft. The word craft, among other things, means skill and cunning. Wild women sometimes refer to our strength, force, skills, and occupations as witchcraft. My own particular craft involves writing and the forging of philosophical theories. Craft is etymologically related to the verb crave. As Voyager, I have spiraled and continue to spiral with my craft because I crave something, because I have a strong longing for something. That quote something is the free unfolding and expansion of my being. Propelled by wanderlust, by wanderlust, my quest is the expansion and communication of my being. I have come to see that taking charge of my craft has been one of my primary slash primal tasks as a pirate, for this is overcoming the quote woman as vessel and quote motif that prevails in stagnation. As I explained this motif slash theme in gynecology, women under phallocratic rule are confined to the role of vessel slash carrier directed and controlled by men. Since that role is the basic base reversal of the very being of voyaging slash spiraling women, when we direct our own crafts slash vessels, we become reversers of that deadly reversal in this process we become crafty 
My reversing of patriarchal reversals in gynecology involved slash required functioning in what might be called, quote, a subliminal mode, end quote. This way of thinking slash writing probably would not have been possible for me if I had not spent years studying medieval theology and philosophy and writing dissertations in these fields at the University of Freiburg, Switzerland, the medieval city in which I lived and studied for seven years. For there I learned to think and write in a theological slash philosophical language that could not say what I was trying to say. So in my dissertations, I was writing in code without realizing that I was doing this. Much later, when I was writing gynecology, that experience of having been ob obliged to think subliminally was very useful. Having, quote, caught on, end quote, in some deep way to the multi-leveled nature of discourse, I was enabled to reverse the process I had learned in Freiburg and decode patriarchal texts, thus exposing their hidden messages. My writing of the dissertations strengthened my ability to go to the heart of a problem, to draw the logical conclusions, to articulate my arguments in a way that is inherently clear in itself, which is quite a different matter from being a good, quote, debater who merely argues to score points but does not seek the truth. Years later, when writing Beyond God the Father and especially Gynecology and Pure Lust, I could draw upon these skills and the confidence that came with them. This was very important for the process of these books because free creativity, the knowledge that overreaches itself, needs to be fiercely focused. To put all of this in a somewhat oversimplified way, the increasing powers of my craft required first learning the rules extremely well in order to break them with precision. Uh, footnote, it is important to stress that this study of medieval theology and philosophy was by no means the acquiring of a mere instrument of destruction. For me, it has been a way of positively reclaiming what was deep and valuable in the tradition so that it could function as a viewer into the background. Okay, back to the text. So my training as a Thomist theologian and philosopher became my labyrinth, labyrinth, enabling me to cut through the man-made illusions and to disclose the deceptive, deadly devices that are used by the academics, media men, and culture controllers of patriarchy, devices such as erasure and reversal. As I saw more and more through their deceptive strategies, my work became wilder while I continued to draw upon my rigor rigorously cultivated precision. My craft spiraled on through the writing of gynecology, breaking down barriers to seeing connections and opening the way for discovering the treasure trove of symbols and myths that had been stolen and reversed by the patriarchal thieves. When I broke through the discovering of these treasures, I was able to examine them, play with them. When I tore them free from their dead casings of patriarchal theological systems, they sparkled and sparked me to make up my own meta-patriarchal metaphors. These metaphors carried my craft so that I felt like a gull sailing with the great wind, which kept calling and carrying me over the shining sea of mind slash spirit space, which I now name the subliminal sea. It is important to understand how the creation of gynecology is related to this subliminal sea. Gynecology and the subliminal sea. As a crafty pirate, I have dared to sail the vast realm of mind space, which is the subliminal sea. This contains deep background knowledge, together with countless contaminants, the man-made subliminal and overt messages disseminated through the media and other channels for the purpose of mind manipulation. Reflecting on my travels in the first spiral galaxy, I recall the experience of being pushed slash directed by a great wind. 
Traveling in that early time involved sailing the surface of the subliminal sea, sensing its depths while not being overtly conscious of the contents of those depths, at least not to a sustained degree. Occasionally, I had conscious glimpses, and these were enough to keep me on course. I could feel through my craft the swishings and swirlings that rocked the boat, so to speak. Some of these, I think, were the results of emotions and psychic sensations that smolder in undersea volcanoes just under the threshold of conscious awareness. These eruptions were my moments of prophecy and promise. In the second galaxy, the intensified momentum of my craft warmed the surrounding waters. Droplets of those subliminal sea waters rose into the air, forming a mist containing vital subliminal information. So when my craft entered this mist, hmm, craft like boat, uh -huh. When my craft entered this myth, mist, I began to see slash hear consciously, me consciously messages from the subliminal deaths. I crossed the limin slash threshold into moments of breakthrough and recalling. From my present perspective, that of the fourth galaxy, I can see that I was then beginning my work as a pirate of the mist. In the third spiral galaxy, the time of gynecology, I continued sailing into the mist, but now with the style and flair of an argonaut, I began to see a new light through the mist. This occurred more and more as I became active in the practice of spinning, in the arts of nodding and unknotting, and realized the vertigo of creation. The light that I began to see, and by means of which I could see, I would now call bedazzling. That is, it has the power to eclipse the foreground world with the brilliance of the background being. Gynecology as a verb. In the original introduction of this book, I wrote, quote, writing this book is participating in feminist process. This is problematic. For isn't a book by its definition a thing, an objectification of thinking slash imagining slash speaking? Here is a book in my hands, fixed, solid. Perhaps, hopefully, its author no longer wholly agrees with it. It is, at least partially, her past. The dilemma of the living slash verbing writer is real, but much of the problem resides in the way books are perceived. If they are perceived slash used slash idolized as sacred texts, like the Bible or the writings of Chairman Mao, then of course the idol idolaters are caught in a wheel that turns but does not move, end quote. To put it another way, I have always seen guide ecology as part of a movement, including my own journey, which has continued since that writing and continues because I am not a noun, but a verb. When I set it free so it could be in the world, I did not see it as a work of perfection. For some women, it could be an awakening shock. For others, a source of information or a springboard from which they might leap into their own amazing searches, words, and metaphors. Above all, I was acutely aware that I had not done or written everything. I had not written the last word. Otherwise, how could I ever write again? Rather, I had set free this book, this bird, in the hope that its song would be heard and that it would harmonize with the works of other women whose melodies, of course, were coming from different realms of the background. I looked forward to the profusion of new creation, which I believed could emerge from women of all races, cultures, classes, from women all over this planet, speaking slash be speaking out of our various and vital heritages. I thought of our rich and radiant diversity. And this has happened and is happening because our time has come. Particularly moving to me personally is the work of the women of Ireland, that treasure island which I recognize deeply as the wellspring of my background, my ancestral home. Especially gynergizing, gynergizing, gyner energizing, gynergizing. 
Especially gynergizing on a global scale is the new abundance of creation from women of color. Explosions of diversity do not happen without conflict, however. One of the responses to gynecology was a personal letter from Audre Lorde, which was sent to me in May 1979. For deep and complex personal readings, I was unable to respond to this lengthy letter immediately. However, when Lorde came to Boston to give a poetry reading that summer, I made a point of attending it and spoke with her briefly. I told her that I would like to discuss her letter in person so that we could have an adequate opportunity to understand each other in dialogue, and I suggested places where we might meet for such a discussion. Our meeting did in fact take place at the Simone de Beauvoir Conference in New York on September 29th, 1979. In the course of that hour or so long meeting, we discussed my book and her response. I explained my position clearly, or so I thought. I pointed out, for example, in answer to Audre Lorde's objection that I failed to name black goddesses, that gynecology is not a compendium of goddesses. Rather, it focuses primarily on myths and symbols, which were direct sources of Christian myths. Apparently, Lorde was not satisfied, although she did not indicate this at the time. She later published and republished slightly altered versions of her originally personal letter to me in this bridge called My Back and in Sister Outrider as an quote, open letter, end quote. It continues to be my judgment that the public response in kind, that public response in kind would not be a fruitful direction. In my view, gynecology is itself an, quote, open book, end quote. I regret any pain that unintended admissions may have caused others, particularly women of color, as well as myself. In writing, the writing of gynecology was for me an act of biophilic bonding with women of all races and classes under all the varying oppressions of patriarchy. Clearly, women who have a sincere interest in understanding and discussing this book have an obligation to read not only the statements of critics, but also the book itself and to think about it. Gynecology and Rage Gynecology can be seen slash heard as a thunderbolt of rage that I hurled into the world against the patriarchs who have never ceased to massacre women and our sister, the earth. I write it in a time of great rage when women were wildly moving, inspired by their creative fury. Rage is not a stage. It is a transformative focusing force that awakens transcendent emotion. It is my broom, my fire-breathing winged mare. It is my spiraling staircase leading me where I can find my own kind, unbind my own mind. Rage, however, can be displaced in reaction to the absolutely righteous rage of women of color against racism. Some women treat, retreat into passivity, hostility, and guilt, often displaying energy into targeting scapegoats. The latter can become de-energized, losing the ability to focus the rage. The winners in this game, of course, are the patriarchs themselves, who, by the way, invented it. Having embedded self-hatred and horizontal violence into women, they leave us to our own devices for becoming distracted into destroying ourselves rather than engaging in an honest and thoughtful battle against racism and woman-hating. So may this new intergalactic introduction be my clarion call to us all, that we refuse this destruction by refusing to be distracted any more from the gynergizing focus of our rage. I think it is high time that gyne slash ecological volcanic rage be discovered again and again. Gynecology and spiraling into the 90s. The impossible slash possible dream of radical feminism has never died. It is true that for many, especially in the course of the decade of decadence we have just survived, it seemed to fade. What happened, in fact, is that it receded sw somewhat into the depths of the subliminal sea. But sister pirates, who are also divers, have worked to retrieve it. 
Moreover, it is surfacing again, seemingly of its own accord. I think that our time is coming round again as we enter the 90s. Uh, however, this resurging of the dream is no mere passive event, no spectator sport. It must be realized. This is a tremendous challenge. I think that as voyagers, we now face the challenge of entering the age of cronehood of radical feminism. It is probably the case that the so-called, quote, first wave of feminism in the 19th century did not surge into the age of cronehood, even though there lived individual crones, such as Tr Sojourner Truth and Matilda Jocelyn Gage. For as a collective movement, feminism became, quote, stuck, and there was not the possibility then of fully seeing the multiracial, multi-class, and indeed planetary dimensions of the women's movement. Nor was it possible to know that our sister Earth is in mortal danger. In the, quote, second wave, end quote, although there has been a dreary expenditure of energy reinventing the wheel, we are moving toward understanding that a qualitative, yeah, qualitative leap into cronehood is necessary for survival. It is a desperate time, but desperation, too, can be a gift. Desperation combined with fu furious focus can hurl a significant new cognitive minority of women into the age of cronehood, the time of realizing the fourth dimension. While feminists have always been a minority under phallocratic rule, the new cognitive minority includes women who constitute a memory-bearing group. Crones who have, quote, been around, end quote, and can recall, recall earlier moments and who can bear the memories, learn from them, and open the way for change. There is, of course, eminent danger of succumbing to psychic numbing. We could continue to drift as vessels driven by men in power, but we have the power to choose. We can seize the decade by taking charge of our crafts. We can move. So I am hurling gynecology out again. It is as it was and as it is. I have moved on and am moving further on to the creation of other books. I hope that in its richness, as well as in its incompleteness, gyne slash ecology will continue to be a labrous, enabling women to learn from our mistakes and our successes and cast our lives as far as we can go now in the bedazzling 90s. And on that note, that is the end of her new introduction, 